weed it's impossible <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so there's work to do for people, I suppose, isn't there then? There is. They, they've been redeployed. So the feedback you get is, and you have to do it in stages. So okay. if you don't, you, if you can't get through one stage, it sort of stops the applications as well. So I think I've got so many tickets into the ESFA. <laughs> and they must be running out of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that bloody Linda Martin again. It is. I'm Powell. sure that's what they say. I mean, they're like, no, she's... <laughs> That's good though. Someone's got to do it. Yeah. Well, I could already probably say that bloody Linda Martin. <laughs> Is that your official title from now on? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> that bloody Linda Martin. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Linda. I used to. I used to be training uh, when I was in my Dale Carnegie days. I used to train with somebody who was in the Navy. And he said, it doesn't matter how you get remembered, whether it's good or bad, people forget why they know your name. They'll just remember your name. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not a bad thing then. No. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's really That'd funny. That'd probably be me with a cigarette in hand and a gin in the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why your camera's off, Lindsay? Have you started early? Oh, I'm like, no, it's not myself. I'll tell you, I own crap at this thing. <laughs> Uh, which one I press? Uh, left hand corner, video on. There you oh, go. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not just check. No gin, no cigarette. Don't worry, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know what my husband's doing? It's so terrible this lockdown. My cigarettes get delivered, right? He then takes out five as if you cannot smoke more than 15 a day. He's like, he's like at school. He's rationing me. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, welcome, everybody. It's been a bit of a week, hasn't it? I can't wait. It's been a bank holiday week, but it doesn't feel... I don't know what anyone else thinks. It doesn't really feel like it's been a bank holiday week. It's been a strange one, hasn't it? And it's now Thursday already. So, um, yeah. Oh, Barbara just wants to join. So I'm just going to put the link for the session back into the chat as well, which is good. And Barbara is the head of quality for Babington. I was connecting with her yesterday and she was keen to join so I thought she'd really add value to our conversations as well so let me just bring Barbara in um how is everybody have you had a good week or a crazy week or uh how's it been weird <laughs> tell me about that <laughs> yeah. why has it been weird Christine um I, I just think I mean even though it doesn't really feel like it's been a bank holiday um because just it's every day's kind of rolling into another one there, there has almost been that kind of bank holiday mentality and and it's like everything needs to be crammed into a short space of time and mm. um yeah so it's just been a bit weird and then of course all the off qual stuff came out on friday and and that's um there's just so much documentation to go through and um, you know, and, and sort of Ofqual's got their spin and then the Federation of Awarding Bodies have done their bits and every other awarding body has got their own little bit with their own spin on it, which is... Is that for functional different. skills, Christine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's about, it's for, it's for all the other vocational technical qualifications as well, but really I suppose my main, main area of focus is around the functional skills. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and then, you know, there's the externally assessed component has to be dealt with one way and the internally assessed component has to be dealt with another way and you've got the legacy and the reformed functional skills to have to deal with as well so it's all just a bit like mm. yes weird i'm sure you've got it licked though <laughs> well, i hope so <laughs> yeah because if anybody comes to me and asks me anything and then i give them the wrong information then that's not good for me is it well, interestingly, Barbara just joining us now. It was Barbara that kicked off that question and conversation in the meeting. So I joined a meeting yesterday that Ginger Nut Training hosts, and they do it every six weeks. Um, so it's very similar to this kind of forum. And um, I've been working with them a little bit on their digital strategy. So I jumped in and, and just kind of got a view for what they were talking about. This is Barbara joining now. Um, and it was very similar to the type of stuff that we've started talking about, which is why I started kind of popping in the chat the questions around functional skills and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's um, I think, yeah, it's been a real topic of conversation this week from what I can, what I can gather. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, it, it's just 
there's quite a bit of work that's got to be done in quite a short space of time and it is so crucial that um, the provider gets every learner that needs to be claimed into that one claim mm -hmm. um, because there's going to be no opportunities to to do uh, another claim it's just one claim and then that's it and also um, the awarding organization does have the final say they're looking at the profiling of the provider on, and the historical data well, of course with the reform functional skills there isn't really any historical data for this time of year because um, the there wasn't any testing this t they didn't come in until september last year so you know there's nothing that can be done to sort of historically claim that the new functional skills are more difficult they're asking for passes as well as fails which means that there's more work for providers to put in because they've got to show why it's a fail and all the rest of it and i think the um the awarding organizations are going to be um advising their eqas or whatever they call them sbs or whatever um to do some stringent checks because you know the potential for malpractice is is quite um, significant I think because of the volume of work and the evidence that has to be put forward in order to be able to validate the grade for each of these learners and if you think about a large provider we're coming up to contract year end so a lot of you know things like colleges and stuff like that they would have a huge amount of learners that will be going through the processing at this this period of time and so you know it, it's just like what do tutors do and then the other side as well is that if staff that the, the, there's very very strong insistence that the people who are doing the grades are the people that did the teaching to the learners in the first place and if those staff have been furloughed where the hell do you get that information from you know and if they're just being brought back then they've got to get up to speed with what's going on as well so i think it's a huge challenge for providers and that potentially could uh, could mean that that some will try to cut corners and that could then sort of open up another can of worms with huge malpractice claims going forward um because i, I have to admit um in the, i would say uh, in the moderation role that i've had with um ocr um, in the last 12 to 18 months, I've submitted more suspected malpractice than I have in the previous wow. seven years. Um, and whether it's just people are not sure what they're doing or they're cutting corners because of time pressure and stuff, you know, it, it's just, um, it's a bit scary, really. Mm. So I don't envy providers at all. Mm. Hey, Barbara. Hi, uh, thank Hi. you for um, inviting me onto the call. So interesting. And I just wanted to maybe add one thing is that what um, you don't hear is, um, you know, providers um, give learners opportunities to reset functional skills. Hmm. So, you know, where a learner, for instance, our data would show maybe first time pass rates is not that high. Second time pass rate is better. And then third time they all get there. So our profile for functional skills would be actually very high for final functional skills results. So hmm. why would, we, you know, as we're assessing learners now, you know, we are working towards them passing their exams and making sure that we're continuing the learning, etc., so that they're at the level that is needed. So I think that's where the difficulty lies. I think about, you know, how the AOs are going to make their judgment about, like you say, pass profile one, one because it's new the, with the reform, but mm. two as well is how are they going to take into account the usual amount of first time pass rate, second time pass rates, etc because you know apprentices eventually get through their functional skills after a few attempts so you know and, and that again I think is something that has not really been highlighted anywhere that I could see. No I agree and I think the thing as well Barbara is where where at all possible it would be much easier to get the learners to actually still do a test yeah um, because then you haven't got all this hassle but um, I mean, I noticed, uh, I was reading something from Pearson's. I mean, I have to confess, I've not read through all the awarding organisation stuff yet. I've just gone through the key ones. Um, but Pearson's are saying that anybody who um, was registered to do a normal test between, I think it's the 1st of June and, and the 
15th of June, but don't shoot me. I'd have to check that if you need the information. Um, but if somebody was registered for a normal test in that window, they're asking you for to stop that test and to do no testing in that window. Well, that, that two weeks is quite a crucial period for people who are wanting to finish their apprenticeship before the end of the contract year end. You know, and it takes away the opportunity for providers to, to sort of try and get as you're quite rightly saying, Barbara, that, that sort of um, the first two weeks of July is a big testing time in, in my experience because that still gives you a little bit of opportunity to put some extra work in and to still get people tested before the end of July where, you know, that is the crucial time and that window being taken away, you know, from one of the biggest providers for functional skills, I think is quite significant. Um, so yeah, I think they're offering the possibility to obviously put mock tests within the, the calculated results as well as practice papers. So I think that's the way that we're doing it is using yes. those um, and completing um, professional discussions after the practice papers, which we're recording, either yes. in writing or, or verbally, so that it's a strong evidence that the learner has done it themselves and that they are truly working at that correct level yeah and i think and one of the recommendations i'm putting forward is you need to make sure that the evidence that you are putting forward it doesn't need to be massive it just needs to be strong exactly. and you need you need to be able to confidently you know i mean almost i would say you need to confidently stand up in front of the lead inspector for ofsted and yeah. be able to say yes this is this learner can really do this and this evidence is valid without them thinking mm, you know and, and i think it does need to be that robust because i think that's the kind of scrutiny that they, these assessed grades are going to come under that's exactly what i'm saying to all of mine i think hand on heart is that learner at the right level and then we've got a matrix that we've created where it'll show that they've really either they've got evidence like a mock that would show they're at that level but where there aren't uh, is there any other piece of evidence that can be used against all of the criteria of the functional skills that would, you know, showcase their ability to work at that level? So, you know, if we need to take evidence from their core program, showing that they have done a presentation verbally, etc., does it truly cover all of the criteria of functional skills? So, yeah, it needs to be robust. You're absolutely right. Yeah, definitely. I'll shut up now, Erica. <laughs> You see, you I mean, should know by now, don't get me on a soapbox. <laughs> that's all right. We wanted the soapbox. We needed the soapbox. It's yeah, okay. It's, it's, it's almost like I'm like one of those little toys, you know, wind me up and set me off and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's what this call is for, is to, is to debate those challenges and changes that we're seeing at the moment. And, you know, Paul, no doubt you'll have a view on this in a minute. And, and Lindsay, you know, you've done some great work around the standards that we can talk about today as well, the endpoint standards. So, um, yeah, no, don't apologise. It's all really good stuff. I think with the endpoint standards as well, you know, the, the, there are some of the vocational and technical qualifications that are going to be tied up in all of this process as well. Um, you know, and, and where functional skills is a cornerstone to a lot of, of the... Um, you know completion of stuff at least some um relaxation has been put around being able to go for endpoint assessment without having a grade where you know as long as they've got the proof that the, that learner would be at that stage because you know the grades aren't going to be coming out till um around gcse a level results time anyway um, and that could stop a lot of completions within this contract year and, and, and that's yeah. not good. Mm -hmm. So it's good, that relaxation as well, that is really good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Paul, well, so. have you got a view on that and how you're managing it at your end? Um, in terms of functional skills, um, we have um, a number of learners with two awarding organisations and we've been busy this week trying to to, to organise all of that information in terms of what um, Christine's been talking about and absolutely just making sure that we come back to that that audit guidance word, don't we? Irrefutable. I saw you smile uh, when Barbara mentioned that, when Christine mentioned that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so, so we're busy with that. In terms of endpoint assessment, um, it's a mixed bag. Um, so, um, uh, and I mentioned Highfield and um, CSP level two going ahead 
Um, so, so we had some who had started endpoint assessment as we entered into this period and continued, and we've got others that uh, have come in. They've been really responsive. So, um, you know, we're receiving as normal updated employer specific contracts and so on. Um, other EPAs, we've literally heard nothing. We've been inquiring for weeks and we've heard nothing. Um, and and it, it just, you know, it comes back to conversations we've been having for the last couple of weeks about the inconsistencies from endpoint assessment organisations. And it's... Um, can, I, can I say something here, Paul? Would you yeah. know I find, because I contact them all the time, if you send them to an email to their... So let's say you're an employer alert or whatever, you send an email to their, their address, they, their email address, they say contact them, you get an email back, we will contact you within 14 days, seven days. It's disgusting, you know, and it's not just one or phone numbers that aren't working. They've had nothing to do except go to their websites and say contact us on these phone numbers, contact us on these emails, and they haven't done it. It's just like, we'll be back whenever. Yeah, absolutely right, Lindsay. And, and uh, you know, we are all, it doesn't matter what organisation you are, what type of business you are, we're all in, in this situation. So we, I understand that staff has been furloughed, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I've literally had emails which have said that and also um, uh, email boxes which turn around and say there's different contact details to, to do. So, yeah, you follow the, the chain, um, but you still don't get to the end result that you, you need to. Um, and it is it is very frustrating, particularly as we said, you know, we are getting nearer and nearer to Gateway and we're doing all that we can. And as I expressed before, you know, we follow all of the guidance. We follow what we're supposed to do as a provider. But at the end of the day, it's the learner that's going to be penalised if we're not able to get them to endpoint assessment in a timely manner. The repercussions for us later on, we can, you know, potentially argue the point, look, you know, we've done everything we can, we can evidence that, et cetera. But from a learner and employer's perspective, um, and if you look at it from a commercial perspective, they're paying for that service and that service isn't there. It's not available. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any re, you know, repercussions at the moment for, for endpoint assessment organisations. And I'm not, looking, I'm not looking that far at this stage, but by the same token, all that we're hearing from, whether it be um, the um, ESFA or DFE or whatever it is, is, you know, you must, you must, you must as a provider. And we're expected to follow to the letter. Well, then all parties should be doing that. Absolutely. Lindsay, I'm really interested for us to talk about the piece of work that you've done, because I think that that's really um, going to provide us with a lot of insight. But just as we're kind of talking about endpoint assessment there, it might be worth just getting um, Linda and Karen's view in kind of any updates this week and, um, you know, um, you know, what, what does that mean from you guys? What are you seeing? Because seeing? Linda, you've been updating us with the off-call conversation, the IFAC conversation, et cetera. So, so what's the update so from you guys? What's I mean, again, yeah. it, it's, it's, yeah, I can only Could I just add from... something in there before you um, You're right. you probably provide more detail than I? So um, I would just follow on from Paul, really, in that I think it's really important that training providers are contacting endpoint assessment organisations and chasing their apprentices to see what stage they're at. Because I think there's so much possibility that apprentices have fallen down into cracks over the past couple of months. Um, I know that we might have had apprentices come into EPA and their managers might have said, well, give us a bit of time. We want a break first. We'll contact you. Um, the EPA might not contact them. The employer might Or the functional skills the... piece that we've just talked about. That could yeah. be another gap, I suppose, Karen, couldn't it as well? Yeah. So I think there's potentially a lot of apprentices that are in EPA actually might not be progressing in EPA. So I'd just encourage you to keep on top of them, really. That's all I was going to add. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, it's, a re it's a really good point um, to add as well. And again, I can only talk from um, professional assessments uh, point of view because we, we are assessing um, clearly the sectors that we work in, particularly hospitality, there are um, added complications there because that sector has been hit um, very hard, but there are some flexibilities now that allow us to progress um, from gateway. And we are having championed um, and asked for lots of the flexibilities, we are using them. Um, I guess one of the delays there is that, um, so for example, the observations are being replaced by um, really a portfolio set of evidence and Q&A. 
is that actually um, the delay now is getting the portfolio evidence to us. So where perhaps we had assumed that that would be reasonably easy for a training provider to get hold of, um, in some cases that's proving uh, more problematic. So I mean, our numbers at the moment, we've got about um, 150 apprentices that are suspended and, and in part that's quite often because they want to and that's in part sometimes because um, a lot of them are quite happy using webinar technology but some of them really are not and um, I think again it's that whole sort of support piece as well that um, their, their support has obviously been their training provider but also their colleagues and peers and line managers at work and, and they haven't sort of got that around them. So I think we've been doing a lot of work on, on building their confidence. And we've actually got literally two people working with, if you like, and trying to track down those apprentices. We've then got around 450 apprentices in EPA. We've now got more coming through because of the functional skills flexibilities. That could get a bit messy because in some ways you can start the EPA, but what if they pass the EPA and then the AO says they haven't passed their functional skills? Oh yeah. We've got to come, to, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it, because where do you stand there? Um, I think, and I, and I think again, just looking at the functional skills, where there is no requirement for upskilling, that's going to be quite interesting because I think if I was still a provider, I would be arguing, well, actually, my level two functional skill rates are likely to be higher than they have been because I haven't had to do so much upskilling. And if you think about it quite often, which is why it was always such a bizarre and, and unfair ruling that you were literally putting in some apprentices to do their level two functional skills, knowing that they were going to fail. And I, and I just have never got the logic of that. But if you haven't got to do that, then your rates will be better. So I would say I, I can only talk from, from our perspective and we chase down every apprentice. We chase down providers. We chase down employers where we can by you know, any means that we can as well. But I think the situation is, is really difficult in certain sectors when you've got employers furloughed as well. And, and whilst we can proceed, it, again, it's the, the best way is that there is that sort of triage of involvement and, and that it's a bit lopsided at the moment as well. And again, um, our focus is just for the apprentice, we do give them the options as well. Do you want to, to proceed with your endpoint assessment using the flexibilities or do you want to stop, give yourself breath and wait until, you know, there may be you know, a reopening or something like that as well. We're finding most of them want to go for the flexibilities. Not surprisingly, again, maybe because of the sectors that we work in, um, there aren't any firm guarantees that yeah. actually, you know, you're going to be going straight back into where you left off as well. So I think, yeah, there's that whole piece. I mean, there's a whole piece on apprenticeships and, and the impact that there's going to be on apprentices. And clearly the impact is going to be far more pronounced in certain sectors as well so it's again is their head on endpoint assessment or is their head in actually have i got a job mm. as well so i think there's yeah there's there's huge that there are just huge pressures and i just feel for everybody in the system at the moment i, I have to say i think it's it's so challenging um at every level in terms of what um i don't know what comeback there are for epaos i mean technically one, we should, our asses should be kicked if we're not getting it right uh, by whoever the regulator is for that particular standard. Secondly, we should be brought to book by um, the SFA. Uh, but again, they seem to be a lot of the people that would be perhaps involved in that and dealing with these sorts of issues seem to be working on other things. So you've got, you've got almost, you know, like Lindsay's saying that you've got a helpline and very nice people on the, the help desk, but can't actually help you. Mm -hmm. All they can do is, is refer your ticket to somebody, to somebody else as well. To so someone yeah, who's on furlough. It, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I just think, you know, if you're not getting your service from your EPAO, you just need to keep absolutely shouting um, about it. I would say though, um, there are some EPAOs that are working really, really hard 
um, out there and doing everything they possibly can um, for their clients. Um, and I think perhaps what we'll see when we get all through this as well, it's that difference, not in the assessment piece, it's that difference in how EPAOs see customer service mm. and see how they treat their clients. And I think that's, that's where some EPAOs really need to do a lot better. Um, Can I ask you a question, um, Linda? Um, yeah. First of all, I'll make, make the point, uh, um, I'm not in hospitality, we don't deliver in hospitality. <laughs> the Probably a good thing, I'd say. The approach that you have as an endpoint assessment organisation is exactly what I would expect and would hope from the endpoint assessment organisations that we're working with. And like I said, some are, are very good um, in terms of the communication piece, etc., um, whilst others literally totally other end of the spectrum, no contact. As a provider, um, and I suppose this is to, to everyone, one of the things that I was um, um, conscious of very early on um, uh, in, in the um, uh, situation that we're currently going through, I had contact from my relationship manager at the ESFA asking for two things. The first one was our business continuity plan, and the second one was any support that, that we require from the ESFA. As an endpoint assessment organization, did you receive the same contact where you asked for business continuity and any support that you needed? No, um, we have got um, a business continuity plan and a risk assessment plan. No, you're um, essentially, I think in the, in the process when you apply to go on the register, there is a whole list of policies um, that they actually want uh, to see. But, but essentially, I think the role that the SFA has with the Endpoint Assessment Organisation is, is very much around that register piece and getting onto the register to deliver the standards. I think thereafter, they rely on, if you like, the external quality assurance provider to do a lot of those checks and balances. And I'm gonna be really honest in this forum, have any of the EQAPs contacted us to say, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And we work with a few. We've had one email um, asking us specifically. So we've had emails about information and flexibilities that we, we all know about anywhere and can get from various sources. But we've only had one contact in terms from, from one EQAP saying, how are you managing with the new flexibilities as well? But no, nobody has said um, to us, look, we can see your pipeline here because obviously the SFA can see our pipeline, what's happening in terms of pipeline, the information that we've had to give to them, Paul, and in fact, they stopped doing that, but they're going to start it again, was the number of cancelled um, endpoint assessments. So that's, that's the thing that they were monitoring um, for about six weeks was um, how many endpoint assessment organ um, sorry endpoint assessments have been cancelled and what was the reason for the cancellation that's that's it what they've done with that data I couldn't tell you oh yeah you know, or how they they've used that data um, I couldn't I couldn't tell you but that's what they they were actually um, asking for but have they come back to us and said well you've got you know this week you've said X number of cancellations what are you doing about it no right okay so the, the business continuity plan that i'm talking about was covid19 specific yeah. so not our gen general one because obviously um no, yeah, we haven't been other that, that sort of but, but they wanted to know what our our specifics were okay no. it's just really interesting what other providers um uh, contacted and asked for that information i just wonder if that's a consistency barbara i don't know if you want to jump in and just talk about from from babington's perspective yeah so we we've got um weekly updates we've got an epa manager so um, she's in in touch every week with all of the epaos just get an update from what they're doing trying to lobby where there have been issues where people have not moved forward in terms of thinking digital um solutions etc um it has worked in some instances and, and hopefully they are hearing our voice. Um, some are slowly starting to move um, and really working with us. And, and I think now that the Ofqual obviously, um, you know, um, as, as published, Ofqual has published their, um, their final findings, we are working with them this week where it says in the findings that um, EPAOs should have either adaptation or um, calculated results. And we've not heard back from the EPAOs, for instance, 
or from the AOs uh, on, on what they were going to do. And even for EPAs, we're still working with them um, for some of them. CII is an example where we're having lots of uh, issues uh, for them sort of adapting and, and moving online. So every week we do a, an update for all of the awarding organizations and EPOs we work with. And she literally, um, you know, chases everyone. We've not had too many issues where they're not actually communicating with us. I think we, we have got quite a good relationship with all of them and we've worked out who to go to, but it has definitely changed from having phone calls sometimes to email conversations. That's absolutely true. So the service is not what it used to be before COVID for instance, but um, I've not heard that we've not managed to talk to them. Uh, it's just different. And some of them are still very slow in reacting and hearing our concerns, I think, absolutely. I, w I will ask about the, um, you know, the business continuity plan. I'm not yeah. sure whether we've received that from all of them. So I, I will definitely ascertain that. And have you been asked for your business, your COVID plan by the ESFA? Well, we've done one, but I wouldn't necessarily deal with that side. So okay. I can I can check whether we've been asked, but um, I've not. Um, I know we've been in communication with the ESFA, but I'm not sure exactly what's been asked and what's been sent okay. to Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Can I just backtrack a little bit on something um, Linda said as well, and just endorse it um, because I think the the what she said about the removal of the requirement for the level two testing for functional skills where only level one's achieved or, or need, is needed. I think that mandatory testing removal is going to have a significant impact on the pass rates of providers. I think it's going to potentially be a huge issue because if providers are entering higher levels of passes for level two as a percentage, which is expected because they haven't got these people who aren't ready to do the level two who have to have to do it. I think that could cause some issues around the results that the awarding organizations are maybe thinking are valid. And because there is no right, to, there's no appeal against these results that come out from the awarding is organization not? no oh, okay the only appeal is against the process so if a if a provider feels that the awarding organization hasn't followed the right process they can appeal but there is no appeal against the results and so i think it is so so important that you know this this case is put forward by the provider to justify why their level two passes are probably higher than historically because they're going to be mm. Mm. okay okay <clears throat> That's interesting. It'd be good for us to continue this conversation. I think at the moment it's going to be a bit of a sticker on a weekly basis, isn't it? So let's um, so let's continue that. Um, Lindsay, are you okay just to talk about the piece of work that you've done um, over the last day or so around the standards and, and the types of research and what you found out? And I think you posted it on the chat yesterday, didn't you? Around or was it this morning? Um, yeah, I think I posted it this morning. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things I want to bring up um, for training providers. Many of you, because we're looking about going back to normal and obviously we want businesses to start taking an apprenticeship. So I started to look at the Find Apprenticeship Training Provider Register. It's been broken for the last seven weeks. Harry from Ginger Nuts said the same yesterday. Yeah, right. It's been people are updating their information, but actually it's taken away information. It doesn't say whether you can work with levies. It doesn't give contact numbers. And so this started me thinking. So I started looking at standards what standards are delivered and what i was really shocked at is we've got 106 standards i've got no epaos and no apprentices because my background is working with businesses so you know you don't have products on the shelf if they're not selling hmm. you know last year we had the uh, institute on twitter we're on the standard 300s 301 302 but we've got all these standards and there's nobody working on them our core standards, the majority of um, apprenticeships are done by 56 standards. After that, or another 100 done by, uh, covered by 60,000 apprenticeships. As a sector, we need to get our act together. We're too fluffy, too woolly. You know, if I was a business looking for um, an apprenticeship and you went on there, you would find 
not there's nobody doing this stand there's no apprenticeship training providers it ma makes our sector suck mm. you know and i was really shocked at these figures because we've got 490 standards but actually you could cut them down to 103 mm -hmm where we got punched we could offer a really good quality service what is the point of having a standard that's got one apprentice on it mm. if you go on there it's, it's this information is updated daily so it's not that i'm making we need to make our sector strong mm. because at the moment our sector is not strong we're leveled in paperwork bureaucracy um we have you know we have training providers there's one that i looked at the other day they only had an offset visit a month ago they're they're on the register their information on their website was showing them paying uh, apprentices £2.64 an hour and the old SFA logo. Jeez. You know, and I, wonder, I wonder, Lindsay, if um, some of those EPAOs with very sl small numbers will actually survive the COVID and actually could look even like a bleaker picture afterwards because some of them might just not survive with those sorts of numbers anyway. Well, I don't see how they, to be honest, Hannah and I, I do not see how some of these businesses are surviving. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You've got the, we've got the customer service, the business admin, where everybody does them. You know, you've got 39 EPOs covering those standards. That's about the most. I think the most that got covered is about 38, 39 EPOs. There are so many EPOs out there that cover one standard. I can't see them. So are they offering a quality service? Because they can only have one or two apprentices a year come through their books. Because the, the numbers don't add up. And I don't know what the Institute are doing, but they're not often a service. I also don't know what these trailblazer groups, with all respect to anybody who's works on a trailblazer group, have been doing. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Because, three years ago, Lindsay, three years ago. <laughs> you know, as a business person, they've had meeting after meeting, people's time have been taken up to produce a standard that nobody's doing. Mm -hmm. You need to have a lot of, it's like going shopping at Christmas. I'm one of these people just in case, and then two years later, you find a tin in the cupboard outdated. <laughs> and that's a bit like what our apprenticeship system looks like yeah, you are Let's right. have, have a quality system that works for people yes we might get rid of the standards we might not be doing puppeteering nobody's doing puppeteering do you know what I mean but let's get rid of them and so we can go to employers and say we offer a quality service as an alternative we apprenticeships are never going to overtake the role of universities as they've always been known apprenticeship or university forget that equation offer a good quality apprenticeship system for all mm. training providers are bogged down in bureaucracy consultations i'm going to say i think they still go you know there's one consultation after another and you get 120 odd people answer it and that and the fate of the sector is rested on their responses somebody's arses need kicking in this sector to make it work because otherwise a lot of training providers are going to go under mm. epos are going to go under and the the end the people that are going to lose out are young people or people going back to work because they're not going to be a quality system in place mm. so but yeah have a look at the figures the numbers i was just really surprised i didn't expect it to be so many yeah thank you like you said you've posted that in the chat haven't you so thank you Lindsay, for that that's brilliant I just got a question, um, Lindsay. Um, I, I read it um, um, first thing this morning, um, and it, it really interesting um, and really stark. Um, th there's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario here, though, um, as the guidance changed from the first of, of August in this funding year. Um, it'll be really interesting. Have you looked at the analysis to see how many standards that have no apprenticeship starts against them also don't have an EPAO? Yeah. Because that was there was uh 75 no wait a minute yeah uh do, 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 yeah how many approved apprenticeship standards have no active apprentices or epao answer 75. Yeah. so 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 that's not going to move until there's an epao you can't enroll so so we as an organization we're in the scenario exactly that scenario so with the community energy specialist which is on your list um, there is no endpoint assessment organization, but we've got a pipeline of about 80 starts. So we are now ourselves applying and setting up an endpoint assessment organization because that's the only way to find a solution to get these starts on because we're not allowed to. I know. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, some people seem to manage to get around that question. <laughs> um, so, so, so had it been prior to the 1st of August, you could have enrolled without an endpoint assessment organization. And on other standards, 
where thankfully now we've got endpoint assessment organizations in place. We've had those really difficult conversations with employers where they've asked, who's the endpoint assessment organization? And we've said, there isn't one in place yet. And some have said, we're not prepared to take that risk. We're not prepared to enroll where there is no EPAO. And others have said, okay, you need to keep us updated in terms of what's happening with that. So, so you know, there are, there are other uh, conversations that are taking place because the work that you've done and report you've done is really important. But I think there's a bit before that that shows actually, is there any demand that could be met that isn't being met at the moment because the EPAOs aren't in place? I agree, uh, but I just think the Institute for Apprenticeship should really look at this because when you see it like that and it looks stark, it looks, it looks terrible. And when you see that, like I said, that, uh, you know, 15% of standards cover, what, 90% of apprenticeships? Like you said, it's all custom service business admin team leader, isn't it? Yeah, well, not all of them. Some of them are quite interested in the NHS, hospitality. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that people are drawn to. Mm. I do think there some, should be some really hard conversations with the Institute for Apprenticeships. And Jennifer should really get her ass into gear and do something because they're, they're producing all this paperwork. It's on their websites. But when you get down to it, nothing is happening. And some of these standards, because I looked, were they new standards? They've been in place for years. They've been approved for years. You know, because I thought, oh, perhaps they've just been approved. You know, the EPAs are, are applying for them. But some of these standards have been approved for years and they still zero. I agree with you, Lindsay. I think the Institute have got to get their act together because it's just shambles. Um, yeah, I mean, you'll know that I've been, um, I've been on a, a, a trailblazer group and just the bureaucracy and the things that they keep doing and they keep changing. And um, I agree, it loses confidence. You know, people who want to deliver the apprenticeships lose confidence because things keep changing. So they wait till it settles down because they don't want to be delivering something and then it changes. And, and the latest, um, just to cite the learning and skills teacher, the latest with that one is now they're talking about potentially taking the qualification out. So that means then there's going to be a significant change. So people are thinking, well, do we start delivering this now in September? Because if it changes and there's no qualification, then that potentially is going to impact on the funding. And is the funding going to be cut because this qualification isn't in there? Will we then be able to deliver it? Oh, we don't really know what we're doing. We'll put it off another year. And, and so that then loses confidence in what that apprenticeship can offer and I really don't believe that that is the only one that is suffering that kind of bureaucracy and then also you know from our experience the information that the IFA put on the websites against the standards isn't always accurate and Joe, Joe North is constantly <laughs> going back to the relationship manager saying you haven't changed this that's wrong that's still wrong this is ambiguous why haven't you done this and she's she's no longer the chair of, of um, the trailblazer group now so she's not doing that as much but you know it's just crazy the wasted time and the bureaucracy that's going on with the institute and like I say it's just our experience I'm sure it's the same with everybody else. Christine absolutely when I chaired customer service three years ago we had exactly the same experience and as soon that day the day after I got level three over the line there was my resignation to chair not interested anymore see you later oh, <laughs> for the same reason as soon as I got it over the line I was gone. <laughs> and I think one, I think that's one of the, the the things as well Erica that you know I think if the, the trailblazer groups are meant to be made up of employers. Employers have got a job to do to keep their businesses running. They don't want to be tangled up with lots of bureaucracy mm -hmm. because it's all voluntary. And, and they, they invested the time to do the standards in the first place because they saw that there was a need mm -hmm. for that particular apprenticeship to cover a particular role. And then when they're faced with all the bureaucracy, they will get to a point, just like you, Erica, at least you saw it over the finishing line. You know, <laughs> it was hard going, a, believe me. <laughs> yeah, there have been a few where, where they've just said, oh, we're not doing this. Enough, anymore. enough is and, enough. And then it's all yeah. just, you know, falling yeah. apart. And I agree with you, Lindsay. It, it's just so much bureaucracy that is involved in the whole system that it's making apprenticeships look a complete shambles. 
and and it's not delivering on what it should be for learners and that's not fair to the people in the sector who would benefit from apprenticeships sorry another soapbox I'll i think we're all one. having a bit of a soapbox <laughs> today aren't we we're all having a run today <laughs> That's okay. We're allowed to do that. That's okay. <laughs> I suppose the other thing as well is, I mean, yeah, and um, Lindsay's uh, data is, is accurate and Jackie has um, always been doing a lot of work around this. And, and actually, when you look at the standards, there's no real surprise there. The popular standards were the sort of popular frameworks as well. So in some ways, you, you've got that. I think for me, the frustration is sometimes the standards that they won't advocate for such as business admin level two oh, ludicrous yeah. um we are actually now debating and uh, again it has been bloody linda martin um uh, because cleaning is obviously going to be such a massive issue now there yeah, is um yeah. healthcare cleaning support that has got an epao in principle i should say as well the epaos in principle don't show on that data Lindsay so for example if you looked at uh, senior culinary chef level four it will say no apprentices I know this no EPAO we have actually said from professional assessments point of view we will be the EPAO in principle so that allows um, people to sign up but that's not that's not flagged but we are actually um, really trying to push for a commercial cleaning standard at level two not one that's healthcare to clean, sort of cleaning because that's clinical support and we are being told there is no demand for it and you couldn't make it a level two and what we're saying is the equivalent standard which would be housekeeping doesn't cover it it's not going to it's it's not the right standard for if you like the level of um technical skills now people are going to need just in terms of cleaning and maintaining that's a no-brainer you know, spaces and, and just uh, not have um, so i'm trying every which way i'm, I'm yeah. liaising with another epa i mean there's a couple of epas and and sort of people that are quite pushy i'm working with a couple of training providers i've got um the housekeepers association sort of ticking over but in some ways it's quite ludicrous because clearly the training providers i'm working with um ourselves our focus actually almost is on you know, just keeping going day to day, mm. not necessarily having to justify something when it, it is so obvious that there is a demand and business admin, there absolutely is a demand. It is ludicrous to have something just at level three and no entry requirement. And I think that's the other frustration sometimes with IFIT is that um, of course you have to look forward, but sometimes you have to look back at history as well and there was a reason why you know you would have had biz ad it was a reason why it was a popular framework it, it doesn't make sense not to have um, a valid alternative but you also have sometimes have to say look the working landscape has changed very quickly um, I probably wouldn't have been arguing for a, a new cleaning standard 12 months ago I would be now because you know that it's going to be needed but that's a, it's a it's it's so difficult to get to get that through and and it almost unless you've got you've got Erica or or Christy real resilience you do just give up because mm. there's just not enough hours in the day to be fighting that battle and potentially you know trying to run a business mm. definitely so I think there there is something to be done and um, Jennifer really she's got you know if she's going to make a difference. She's sort of got to do it now. I mean, she almost had, you know, this new CEO coming in. She had that or has got a maybe a window of opportunity to say, look, you know, we are going to be slicker, quicker, more contemporary. And it doesn't seem to have happened yet. No, and it would have made sense, really, if they'd have put, uh, they'd have put back the T-levels because they haven't even started yet. And I think that would have given, because, you know, there's so much up, up, upheaval that's been going on over these last few weeks to now have the t-levels potentially coming on board when mm. the apprenticeships are not stabilized yet it's just so bonkers mm. um and it would be much better to put that back a, a year and let things settle um and let get the apprenticeships more stable again um but that doesn't seem to be happening 
And we are making the same mistake again. I mean, I remember being on a committee with QCF when that the committee's work was to take off qualifications that weren't being used. So it's not as though <laughs> this is a completely new um, concept. We seem to have made the same mistakes mm -hmm. again as well. So there is that part, you know, about learning. But I think that with, with the trailblazer groups as well, I think that there is now a, a real need um, for apprenticeships to be seen as a viable commercial offer mm -hmm. and a, a, a part of that has got to be you've got to have the standards that are fit for purpose and are fit for the, the working environment as as it currently is and you've got to be able to be quick to if you like take stuff off and get stuff on and we're not at that that sort of particular stage i don't think yeah, and, and, and making sure that the funding band is also adequate for what's required i think that's absolutely, absolutely key, isn't it? Oh, when you gosh, talk about yes, the commerciality <laughs> Well, I thought this was the role of the root panels, which I don't know what they're doing. And I'm always surprised that some of the people that have the position of being the chair of these root panels, because they have they have quite a vocal, well, they should have a vocal voice about what's going on for the root panels they cover. But it seems to be advertised, get, get the position, and then you never hear of these people. Um, I just think we really need to look at all these standards and then you look at the ones that are in development, et cetera, et cetera. And I am just shocked. How did anybody in their right mind even think about doing an apprenticeship standard for some of these standards that they're putting forward or that have been approved? You know, and like we go back to uh, business admin number two that can't be approved because it's too similar to level three. So we put them on customer services, which is happening for them to do it. And that, like we go back to the puppeteer. How many puppeteers, you know, how many puppets have been made in this country? You know, there must be such a demand. Well, there isn't, because there's no apprenticeships, no active apprenticeships. I can't help but just laugh at that, to be honest, Lindsay. I think you're absolutely right. How many no, puppeteer really, apprentices? It, it seems to me like my background is business. I am not an ed I'm not an educationalist. I am not a trainer, whatever. Mine is working with businesses, profit and loss sheets, and what works for businesses. And I'm just... We seem to be heading a downward spiral and we seem to, it's, it is a numbers game to me. You know, there'll be a big celebration when we get to 500 approved standards. You know, the Institute will be sending out press releases. We've read, but actually hundreds, the great, hundreds and hundreds don't do jack. So we really need to have a clean sweep and it's, it's up to the sector, the training providers and EPOs to get together and do something because otherwise we'll just carry on because lots of people think we'll just go back to where we were, be, you know, before the, the virus, but it's not going to be the same, you know, and I was saying to Erica just before the thing started, and lots of my connections, their furloughs come to end, they've been laid off. You look at your connections on LinkedIn, looking, you know, looking for work, looking for opportunities, one after another. The work is not out there. We are going to be losing so many people and they will not come back. So we really need to do something as a joined up sector to make our, you know, not look at the negative and negative sake like some people do, but actually to make it look at what's not working to make the sector stronger and make it a really an attractive proposition for businesses and for learners. Because remember a lot of levy play employers who are paying the levy, there's not even a standard or an EPO that they can actually, their, their levy money can be spent on. So that's, that's my rant for the day, sorry. So, so what's the email address of the person I need to email this recording to? <laughs> Send it to Jennifer. Send it to Gillian. I might go and sit on Gillian, Gillian's doorstep. She only lives 10 minutes down the road from me. <laughs> There you go. We've we, we, we picked it apart. That's what we want to see. Get it done. <laughs> Be outside Gillian's door. Hello, Gillian. <laughs> Don't be gaining yourself to any railings, Lindsay. Oh, I will be out if I can find a horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear well i'm aware that we've got four minutes left in the session and it feels like we've needed to purge a little bit by the, the feel of things today <laughs> um which is fine it, you know so it's, that's what this is here for in a way so we can support each other and share and you know Lindsay, the piece of work that you've done is fantastic and i think it just prompts really good conversation so and um again you know jackie's shared a good piece of work in the chat as well um around epao so i've thanked her for that as well so so, yeah, she presented at my conference before the in January, February, my February conference. Oh, did she? Yeah, yeah. She presented it, so it's really good. Really oh, good. 
Good, 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 good. And um, I guess in terms of your July conference, Lindsay, I guess you still don't know whether you can go ahead with that or not? No, that won't go ahead. That won't happen, so we'll I look don't even virtually think maybe. Like virtual, I was thinking maybe October, but I think people are still going to be worried about going out with Zoom to Zoom. So I think I don't want to put myself under the stress of putting on an event where people don't want to go. It, it's mm. too much hassle. So I might look to next year now. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Let people get back to working in their offices and find out what their businesses are going to be like. I wouldn't have the gut to say, come to my conference and pay this amount of money, pay for hotels, mm. for actually something that you could do on Zoom mm. at the moment. It's great. Networking is great. It's great for all like, people, the support organisations. And I, you know, that's how I make my living. Mm. But I just think it's not the time and place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Any last reflections or thoughts before we finish for today? Everybody a bit done in after that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it 12 o'clock somewhere? I can open up the gin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Erica, for um, inviting me to it. I think it's really insightful and it's great to hear, you know, that we're not the only one thinking those you know same thoughts really i think we're all actually singing from the same hymn, hymn sheet and today you know if we are all on the soapbox it's because actually there are lots of things that need to be addressed and yeah and it, it's so critical that they are addressed whilst at the same time we're trying to close last year and that's what makes it really difficult that sort of you know not having all of the staff around trying to close last year and at the same time looking forward and, and and trying to decide what changes are going to be needed to be a really strong business in the future makes it doubly hard and i think mm -hmm. you know it is a tough time uh, and and will continue to be i'm sure but now feels yeah even harder i suppose um until we we can close last year in some sort of way mm. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And thank you, Barbara, for attending today. And you're in the chat group now as well. So we do meet every Thursday. So whenever you can attend, it would be fantastic. And same for everybody else. So thank you. For, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody, for um, attending today. I'll pop the recording on the chat again. If there's anything else, you know, just bring it into the chat and then we can discuss it on the call. Um, you know, it feels like this kind of ongoing changes piece is going to be around for a wee while. So it gives us a bit of a framework to talk through as well, doesn't it? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank bye you very much. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.